we're going to go over Carl Jung's views on the afterlife. We're going to explore his ideas around life after death. And we're going to do that through presenting Jung's myth, his myth of life after death. And he describes how these are not things which we can understand for certain, but these come from our mythological understandings, from hints from dreams and other such knowledge of the psyche. And so Jung is going to bring us through these ideas of life after death. So first of all, I'm going to open up with what Jung says in his book, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. And he says, What the myths or stories about a life after death really mean, or what kind of reality lies behind them, we certainly do not know. And so here is another quote from Jung. We are strictly limited by our innate structure and therefore bound by our whole being and thinking to this world of ours. Mythic man, to be sure, demands a going beyond that, but scientific man cannot permit this. To the intellect, all my mythologizing is futile speculation. To the emotions, however, it is a healing and valid activity. It gives existence a glamour which we would not like to do without. So we can see there that Jung is talking about the emotional significance that these mythologies of life after death provide for us. There is something about knowing that we're going to live on after life, that life doesn't end with death, that is healing to our emotions. There's something about that that is comforting. So let's keep going when Jung says, leaving aside the rational arguments against any certainty in these matters, we must not forget that for most people, it means a great deal to assume that their lives will have an indefinite continuity beyond their present existence. They live more sensibly, feel better, and are more at peace. So let's keep going with what Jung has to say here. Naturally, such reasoning does not apply to everyone. There are people who feel no craving for immortality and who shudder at the thought of sitting on a cloud and playing the harp for 10,000 years. There are also quite a few who have been so buffeted by life or who feel such disgust for their own existence that they far prefer absolute cessation to continuance. But in the majority of cases, the question of immortality is so urgent so immediate and also so ineradicable that we must make an effort to form some sort of view about it. But how? And Jung begins to explain this when he says, my hypothesis is that we can do so with the aid of hints sent to us from the unconscious in dreams, for example. Usually we dismiss these hints because we are convinced that the question is not susceptible to answer. Let's continue with what Jung says about this. Not only my own dreams, but also occasionally the dreams of others help to shape, revise, or confirm my views on a life after death. And then in another place, Jung says, as I've already said, we cannot attribute to these illusions the value of knowledge, let alone proof. They can, however, serve as suitable bases for mythic amplifications. They give the probing intellect the raw material which is indispensable for its vitality. Cut off the intermediary world of mythic imagination and the mind falls prey 
to the doctrinaire rigidities. On the other hand, too much traffic with these gems of myth is dangerous for weak and suggestible minds, for they are led to mistake vague intimations for substantial knowledge and to hypostatize mere phantasms. We can see with this that Jung is showing that there is a delicate balance. We cannot actually gain complete knowledge from this. We can not offer up any proof of any of these ideas. But what this does do, these dreams, these mythological motifs and ideas, is it provides us with a material to do what Jung calls an amplification or the symbolic amplification, where we line up lots of different instances about the same phenomena. And then what we do is we take away all the minute little differences. And what remains is this meaningful middle of a collection of all the experiences, a through line, if you will, a thread leading through all the different motifs that puts forth a meaning or an idea that we can resonate with, an essence, if you will, that we can hold on to, that we can gleam a, a little bit of understanding from this process of amplification. And so that's the idea of using the hints from the dreams, the hints from the mythology to glean some understanding into life after death and into the workings of the psyche. Let's move on to further explore what Jung has to say about this problem. And he says here, but if an idea about it is offered to me in dreams or in mythic traditions, I ought to take note of it. I even ought to build up a conception on the basis of such hints, even though it will forever remain a hypothesis, which I know cannot be proved. A man should be able to say he has done his best to form a conception of life after death or to create some image of it, even if he must confess his failure. Not to have done so is a vital loss. For the question that is posed to him is the age-old heritage of humanity, an archetype rich in secret life, which seeks to add itself to our own individual life in order to make it whole. So let's continue here when with Jung, who says, Reason sets the boundaries far too narrowly for us and would have us accept only the known, and that too with limitations, and live in a known framework, just as if we were sure how far life actually extends. As a matter of fact, day after day, we live far beyond the bounds of our consciousness. Without our knowledge, the life of the unconscious is also going on within us. The more the critical reason dominates, the more impoverished life becomes. But the more of the unconscious and the more of the myth we are capable of making conscious, the more of life we integrate. And so let's continue with Jung's ideas on this process when he says, the unconscious helps by communicating things to us or making figurative illusions. It has other ways too of informing us of things which by all logic we could not possibly know. Consider synchronistic phenomena, premonitions, and dreams that come true. So let's go further into this realm of what Jung is talking about. Only one must remain critical and be aware that such communications may have subjective meanings as well. They may be in accord with reality, and then again, they may not. I have, however, learned that the views I have been able to form 
on the basis of such hints from the unconscious, have been most rewarding. Naturally, I'm not going to write a book of revelations about them, but I will acknowledge that I have a myth which encourages me to look deeper into this whole realm. Myths are the earliest form of science. When I speak of things after death, I am speaking out of inner prompting and can go no further than to tell you dreams and myths that relate to the subject. So we can see there the range of source material that Jung is pulling from in order to talk about life after death. He describes it as something that may or may not be in in accordance with reality. But however, this reasoning, these insights that he's gained from dreams, from parapsychological uh, experiences and knowledge, has pointed him to these intimations that have been uh, important for him and that have been significant in his life and in his myth. And so uh, we're going to explore more of this myth of the afterlife that Jung is talking about. So Jung spends some time talking about parapsychology, talking about these experiences of how people get foreknowledge or insights or glimpses or information on a certain event happening or a certain object or thing or something going on that is not within the immediate space or location, we might say, or in the temporal uh, experience. So in not in the time, in the present, but sometimes these parapsychological experiences can show up what's called a precognition. Some type of information somehow comes to a person before it actually happens. That's what we call a precognition. And or someone sees something or experiences something from far away. So Jung postulates and talks about this idea that the psyche, at least part or an aspect of the psyche, lays outside the the physical laws of space and time. And so this is a very radical understanding of reality and of existence and of the psyche or the structure of the psyche or how psychic phenomena works or how the mind works, if you will, or the and also the relationship between mind and matter. And so Jung uses the word psyche. So let's stick with that because that has this broader connotation than does just the word mind. But it sometimes helps to understand uh, it through the context of mind because we have philosophical understandings in our current uh, domain of knowledge about the understanding and relationship between mind and matter and that there might be a very unique and interesting way that they have a relationship with each other and that our current conception scientifically uh, may not contain the complete understanding of this. But nonetheless, Jung really did believe in this psycho, these para- psychological uh, understandings of the mind. And he believed that these uh, showed some type of evidence that an aspect of the psyche uh, had this dimension, if you will, of spacelessness and timelessness. And so if we take these as some type of fundamental aspect of the psyche, he then reasons from that proposition um, in in trying to understand uh, how the psyche works and trying to understand the implications of that for the afterlife. And so here's some of the quotes uh, where Jung is exploring this idea. So he says, there are indications that at least part of the psyche is not subject to the laws of space and time. And in another place, Jung says, These experiments prove that the psyche at times 
functions outside of the spatio-temporal law of causality. And then in another place, Jung says, this indicates that our conceptions of space and time and therefore of causality also are incomplete. And then in another time, Jung says, I have been convinced that at least part of our psychic experience is char characterized by a relativity of space and time. This relativity seems to increase in proportion to the distance from consciousness to an absolute condition of timelessness and spacelessness. So we can see here Jung exploring this idea that there is a, a specific dimension of the psyche that when entered into, which seems to be a furthering away from individual experience of consciousness and more into the unconscious, there is this place of timelessness and spacelessness. And he's setting up the parameters of these ideas and concepts because he wants to talk about this function or mythos or mythology of the afterlife that he's going to introduce, right? And he wants to kind of uh, map out the some of the way that the psyche is structured from his view of experiencing these parapsychological experiences of foreknowledge in dreams, of premonitions and precognitions and hunches that you have throughout life and such things, right? And, and, and synchronistic experiences where uh, unrelated meaningful coincidences occur, right? And so he's setting this up, this groundwork up to set up these, these more broader, bigger ideas of uh, what possibly could be going on with this idea of the, uh, the afterlife and our relationship with it. And so uh, Jung shows that and tries to show how dreams and his own dreams uh, really gave him insight into uh, these workings of the psyche and possibly into uh, his, at least his understanding of what he thinks of as going on in the afterlife. And so he basically has these dreams of, and he also has these fantasies that he has with these figures that we see in the red book and in the black books, right? And so as he's doing this, he has these intimations that he's learned from that, some aspect of the psyche. And so he says here, the figures from the unconscious are uninformed too and need man or contact with consciousness in order to attain knowledge. As he says that, he says that based on the idea where he had these fantasies of these figures, these inner figures, one called Salome and one called Elijah. And so Salome and Elijah he said he experienced and then uh, they would guide him, they would talk to him, but they would ask him questions. They would be asking him questions. And then what happened was is they disappeared for two years. So they kind of went back into unconsciousness and he didn't have experience with them or contact with them for two years. But then when they came back, he said and explained that they came back and talked as if no time had passed at all. But Jung had experienced all these different things within those two years. And so he felt there was a lot to catch up on. And from insights like this, and from other intimations he had, and from observing other people, he has this idea that the unconscious in that state where there is spacelessness and timelessness in that state of oneness, right? In the deep collective unconscious where everything is one. There is no differentiation between space. Everything is one. There's no temporal uh, timeline. There's no past, present, future. Everything is one. It's outside of time. In that space, these inner figures that he was contacting with from his unconscious they don't have access or knowledge of consciousness 
or knowledge of the conscious uh, uh, world or experience. And that is what Jung is trying to say here, that the experience and significance of the individual is to have and live out in real life and actuality their conscious experience. And there is a significance to that conscious experience that cannot be attained from unconsciousness. And that's why we are to work in partnership with the unconscious to make it conscious. And it is if we are giving life to these unconscious aspects, we are giving life to an archetype or we are birthing God, so to speak, right? And so this is uh, the role that the individual plays in consciousness because the unconscious is not informed of our consciousness. And this is the interesting mythology that Jung is talking about, about the life after death. Let's continue here with a quote from Jung when he says, Apparently, however, the souls of the dead know only what they knew at the moment of death and nothing beyond that. And then in another place, Jung says, I frequently have a feeling that they are standing directly behind us, waiting to hear what answer we will give them and what answer to destiny. So there is this idea that once you die, you are cut off from the knowledge of consciousness and you are now in this timeless, spaceless aspect of the psyche where you exist as this psychic uh, element or something. And in that domain, you have the knowledge of all who have died and you understand those things up until the point where uh, everyone has everyone who has passed over into the afterlife has died, right? So you have the knowledge of all that experience up until that point. But what you don't know is the knowledge and experience of what people are experiencing as individuals in consciousness who are actually living, right? And so that's kind of the idea there that Jung is putting forth as this uh, mythology of the afterlife, right? And so uh, let's keep going on with what Jung has to say in this regard. And he says, the psyche might be that existence in which the hereafter or the land of the dead is located. So there is this idea that where the people who are dead, they are just existing as an aspect of psyche in some other location, in this timeless, uh, spaceless aspect of the psyche. And in this view, the psyche would be the predominant uh, grounding of reality, in a sense, instead of matter. And matter would be serve a purpose for the concretization of the individual who experiences consciousness. And without matter, you don't experience consciousness and you go back into the unconscious aspect of the psyche. This is kind of the imagery Jung kind of provides for this mythos of life after death. And so it's kind of a interesting speculation. And so Jung later on also says, the maximum awareness which has been attained anywhere forms, so it seems to me, the upper limit of knowledge to which the dead can attain. This is probably why earthly life is of such great significance and why it is that what a human being brings over at the time of his death is so important. Only here in life on earth, where the opposites clash together, can the general level of consciousness be raised? That seems to be man's metaphysical task, which he cannot accomplish without mythologizing. Myth is the natural and indispensable intermediate stage between unconscious and conscious cognition. So we can see in that quote, a summation of the ideas I've been talking about in relation to 
using this myth as a kind of purpose or direction, not just an understanding of the afterlife, but now we enter into an engagement in uh, with this uh, mythos that we accomplish some type of task out of this process of mythologizing because there is actually a significance and purpose uh, thrown back on our actual living life and existence here. It seems as if our consciousness and our task here as living beings is to be even more conscious and raise the level of consciousness. And so in this regard, as conscious living beings, we have the opportunity to participate with the unconscious to make it conscious or to give it life or, or t- for it to live its life through us that we are able to uh, unveil and make conscious the unconscious aspects. And so therefore we are not only self-actualizing and becoming more conscious in ourselves, but we're participating in this kind of grand experience where existence or reality itself or God, so to speak, is becoming conscious through us. And we are participating in that ever reaching expansion of uh, the totality of life itself or the psyche itself. And the psyche is expanding and becoming whole through us, right? We are not only becoming whole through the psyche, but the psyche is becoming whole through us. And that is the powerful message of this uh, mythology that Jung is talking about with this idea of the afterlife. Because the dead, once they die, they can't uh, provide or uh, enter into this function. We can only play this function while we're alive. And the idea is before we die, we are meant to uh, fulfill kind of our purpose or fulfill some type of task or gain this specific knowledge before we die so we can bring it across into our death. We we can't come empty-handed into our death. We bring across something that we've labored for, that we've discovered, and that those people who have been cut off from life, we are bringing almost a gift uh, for them across the line, so to speak, as we die and enter into the afterlife. Jung outlines this further when he says, I could well imagine that I might have lived in former centuries and there encountered questions I was not yet able to answer. That I had to be born again because I had not fulfilled the task that was given to me. When I die, my deeds will follow along with me. That is how I imagine it. I will bring with me what I have done. In the meantime, it is important to ensure that I do not stand at the end with empty hands. So there, Jung is also outlining the idea of reincarnation and karma, because these are mythological motifs that we find throughout religious history, right? And so he's also tying in his understanding of this idea of having a vocation or fulfilling a task that you're meant to do. There's some important goal or understanding of consciousness uh, that you are meant to play out before you die. So your life has this purpose and this task uh, that you're meant to fulfill And so you're meant to fulfill that while you were conscious and alive. And once you've done that, you die and then pass that knowledge and bring it back into the other aspect of the psyche, which is the unconscious. And so uh, it's an interesting mythos that Jung is outlining here. And this is not to say this is definitely what is. This is just to to say uh, to perform this function of the amplification of the symbol, right? So this idea of purpose throughout life and the relationship consciousness has with the unconscious and with the afterlife, right? And so Jung continues on this line of thought when he says, the meaning of existence is that life has addressed a question to me or conversely, I myself am a question which is addressed to the world and I must communicate my answer. For otherwise, I am dependent upon the world's answer. That is a suprapersonal life task, which I accomplish only by effort and with difficulty. 
Perhaps it is a question which preoccupied my ancestors and which they could not answer. So you see there this idea that is kind of like Jung's idea of individuation, that there is this suprapersonal life task that he's to fulfill and accomplish. But now there's this added amplification of the symbol of reincarnation, which is a mythological motif, which we use to gain an insight or a glimpse or a hint into the functional aspect of the afterlife, which then he adds in here that perhaps it is a question which preoccupied my ancestors. So it's this idea that, you know, it can be seen in many different ways. Either I am a soul and I come back and I didn't fulfill my task, so I get sent back in and I go back in and I'm reincarnated into material reality to fulfill my purpose and live out consciously the ideas that I'm meant to fulfill within that time frame. Or if it's not that, it's that my ancestors have uh, were meant to fulfill these certain tasks, but they died without fulfilling it. And therefore I inherited this kind of uh, vocation or task that is meant to be brought or fulfilled through the function of consciousness. And therefore in this time and space, in this narrow space of actual living life of consciousness, I'm meant to complete and fulfill this task, right? And Jung outlines it kind of like a Gnostic in here where he talks about it as a question. There's a question and I'm meant to give an answer. So it's about this almost mystical knowledge, this life task, this knowledge that is not just of the mind, but knowledge uh, of the living, uh, knowledge of consciousness itself, knowledge of the process of living itself, because your life itself is a question and your life itself is an answer. So all your feelings, thoughts, and behaviors become this kind of answer to uh, this life question, which is the ultimate fulfillment or the unraveling of your individuation to find the gold nuggets, which reveals your glory or your specific purpose or value or significance to the world, which is unveil unveiling an aspect of unconsciousness or the hidden uh, gold or treasure in unconsciousness through your unveiling of consciousness and life task within the temporal space and time when you are a living being, right? And so, that is the answer. So this is kind of a Gnostic idea of having and attaining greater consciousness and knowledge. So I have a question and I have an answer. I have attained uh, a consciousness of this aspect of life and the significance of life, right? And so this is this, uh, this mythology that Jung is entering us into when he's talking about these ideas. Jung here continues when he says, what I feel to be the resultant of my ancestors' lives or a karma acquire in a previous personal life might perhaps equally well be an impersonal archetype which today presses hard on everyone and has taken a particular hold upon me. An archetype such as, for example, the development over the centuries of the divine triad and its confrontation with the feminine principle, or the still pending answer to the Gnostic question as to the origin of evil, or to put it another way, the incompleteness of the Christian God image. So we can see in that quote, the summation of what I was talking about earlier, that big rant I went on earlier, explains this idea of answering a question, and it's what type of question? It's the Gnostic question of the origin of evil. It's the incompleteness of the Christian God image. See, it's a part of this aspect of the psyche as it evolves. It is, it is the, like we are playing a role, a function, uh, which God himself couldn't do, and so he needs us to do it. The psyche needs us to play our role in consciousness, to give it life and to be conscious of itself. And so we participate in this mythos. And uh, it's, it's this interesting mythos that Jung is saying is our life's task and this, and this kind of gives us these parameters for trying to understand the afterlife.
And so he continues on this line of thought when he says, if there were no imperfections, no primordial defect in the ground of creation, why should there be any urge to create, any longing for what must be yet fulfilled? Why should the gods be the least bit concerned about man and creation? And so that sums up that point, that God needs man to live out his purpose, to fulfill his potential or its potential or her potential, whatever it is, right? And so this is this mythos that we participate in, right? So the fact that there was a creation at all means, well, something was wrong. There was something missing. And what that was was limitation, right? So if you can picture that spaceless, timeless one, the one, oneness, God, in the primordial state, which is a complete oneness, no differentiation, no consciousness of itself, right? All things in one, right? What What's it's missing is it's missing the differentiation. It's missing the individuation, the specific uh, limit, limitations of a conscious living being. And therefore, the conscious living being uh, is birthed or created for God to continue on the process of its own individuation in that sense, or the psyche or, you know, call it the universe, whatever you want to call it. Let's continue here with what Jung has to say. So he says, Certain souls, I imagine, feel the state of three-dimensional existence to be more blissful than that of eternity. But perhaps that depends upon how much of completeness or incompleteness they have taken across with them from their human existence. It is possible that any further spell of three-dimensional life would have no more meaning once the soul had reached a certain stage of understanding. It would then no longer have to return, fuller understanding having put to rout the desire for re-embodiment. Then the soul would vanish from the three-dimensional world and attain what the Buddhist calls nirvana. But if a karma still remains to be disposed of, then the soul relapses again into desires and returns to the life once more, perhaps even doing so out of the realization that something remains to be completed. So again, this is that idea Jung is circling around the idea of reincarnation to try to understand the idea of the afterlife, to try to understand our uh, conception, our mythology within these parameters of consciousness and then dying And then what is the purpose of all that, right? And so he goes on to say that he doesn't completely know what he really thinks about reincarnation, if it really ultimately is what it is or not. He doesn't know, but he has been influenced by these ideas in some way, right? Because of his dreams and because these ideas do exist in mythological motifs, right? And so... Let's just move on with this next quote from Jung to confirm uh, that point. And he says, We lack concrete proof that anything of us is preserved for eternity. At most, we can say that there is some probability that something of our psyche continues beyond physical death. Whether what continues to exist is conscious of itself, we do not know either. Jung then goes on to talk about these very interesting dreams he had. He had two different dreams that play into this mythos of life after death and play into this interplay of the purpose of consciousness and its interplay with the unconscious, right? And the unconscious is basically what we are entering into after we die. So this is a quote uh, from Jung about these two dreams that he had. Open quote. The thorny problem of the relationship between the eternal man, the self, and earthly man in time and space was illuminated 
by two dreams of mine. In one dream, which I had in October 1958, I caught sight from my house of two lens-shaped metallic gleaming discs, which hurtled in a narrow arc over the house and down to the lake. They were two UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Then another body came flying directly toward me. It was a perfectly circular lens, like the objective of a telescope. At a distance of four or five hundred yards, it stood still for a moment and then flew off. Immediately afterwards, another came speeding through the air, a lens with a metallic extension which led to a box, a magic lantern. At a distance of 60 or 70 yards, it stood still in the air, pointing straight at me. I awoke with a feeling of astonishment. Still half in the dream, the thought passed through my head. We always think that UFOs are projections of ours. Now it turns out that we are their projections. I am projected by the magic lantern as C.G. Jung. But who manipulates the apparatus? I had dreamed once before of the problem of the self and the ego. In that earlier dream, I was on a hiking trip. I was walking along a little road through a hilly landscape. The sun was shining and I had a wide view in all directions. Then I came to a small wayside chapel. The door was ajar and I went in. To my surprise, there was no image of the Virgin on the altar and no crucifix either, but only a wonderful flower arrangement. But then I saw that on the floor in front of the altar facing me sat a yogi in lotus posture in deep meditation. When I looked at him more closely, I realized that he had my face. I, st I started in profound fright and awoke with the thought, aha, so he is the one who is meditating me. He has a dream and I am it. I knew that when he awakened, I would no longer be. I had this dream after my illness in 1944. It is a parable. Myself retires into meditation and meditates my earthly form. To put it another way, it assumes human shape in order to enter three-dimensional existence, as if someone were putting on a driver's on a diver's suit in order to dive into the sea. When it renounces existence in the hereafter, the self assumes a religious posture, as the chapel in the dream shows. In the earthly form, it can pass through the experiences of the three-dimensional world and by greater awareness, take a further step towards realization. The figure of the yogi, then, would more or less represent my unconscious prenatal wholeness and the Far East, as is often the case in dreams, a psychic state alien and opposed to our own. Like the magic lantern, the yogi's meditation projects my empirical reality. As a rule, we see this causal relationship in reverse. In the products of the unconscious, we discover mandala symbols, that is, circular and quaternary figures which express wholeness. And whenever we wish to express wholeness, we employ just such figures. Our basis is ego consciousness. Our world, the field of light, centered upon the focal point of the ego. From that point, we look out upon an enigmatic world of obscurity, never knowing to what extent the shadowy forms we see are caused by our consciousness 
or possess a reality of their own. The superficial observer is content with the first assumption, but closer study shows that as a rule, the images of the unconscious are not produced by consciousness, but have a reality and spontaneity of their own. Nevertheless, we regard them as mere marginal phenomena. The aim of both these dreams is to effect a reversal of the relationship between ego consciousness and the unconscious, and to represent the unconscious as the greater of the empirical personality. This reversal suggests that in the opinion of the other side, our unconscious existence is the real one and our conscious world a kind of illusion, an apparent reality constructed for a specific purpose, like a dream which seems a reality as long as we are in it. And then later on, Jung also says, here is the principle which strives for total realization, which in man's case signifies the attainment of total consciousness. Attainment of consciousness is culture in the broadest sense, and self-knowledge is therefore the heart and essence of this process. The Oriental attributes unquestionably divine significance to the self, and according to the ancient Christian view, self-knowledge is the road to knowledge of God. So we can see in this the accumulation or the, the ultimate end of the myth of what Jung is trying to talk about with this interplay between the conscious and unconscious and the knowledge of the self or the knowledge of God or the knowledge of the psyche. And so there is this role or purpose to consciousness and the ground of reality in this sense, in this view, is unconsciousness, is the totality of the psyche, which births consciousness for a particular purpose to know itself and to realize and actualize itself. And so this idea of the afterlife gives us this sense of purpose that we're meant to fulfill in consciousness. And so to sum this all up, at the very end of this chapter, Jung says, as far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. It may even be assumed that just as the unconscious affects us, so the increase in our consciousness affects the unconscious. Mm -hmm.